Thank you for the kind invitation and hopefully for more years to come. So I was given the task for 10 minutes to get the best uh, which was published in coronary imaging. So I, I hope you will like what I picked. This study here, which was published by the American College of Cardiology in 2020, they looked at the diagnostic accuracy to rule out clinically significant coronary artery disease in patients with non stemi It's called the verdict trial. They looked at patients who were early uh, randomized versus 48 hours plus randomized. And look what they found. Out of 1,000 plus patients, about 26% of those patients had a completely negative CCTA, negative meaning uh, stenosis, which is less than 50%. And this particular study showed us a very good negative predictive value, like what the CCTA is all about, of uh, 90% with a sensitivity of 96%, which is really wonderful in a way that for the non STEMI patients, stratifying them with a CCTA, especially if they are falling here in the negative uh, CCTA, less than 50% of stenosis, uh, that, that will definitely save uh, the patient an invasive strategy which might not be needed. Uh, let's also remember another message, 26% of the patients actually fill in this uh, particular subgroup. Another study, what is the prognostic value of a fraction of flow reserve derived from CCTA if you compare it to SPECT imaging, nuclear imaging. Um, they had a primary uh, outcome uh, of death or non-fatal myocardial infarction and the secondary outcomes as outlined. So they did CCTA for all patients as well as derived, of course machine derived FFR from the CCTA and every patient also underwent SPECT imaging. What did they find? Well, they stratified all the coronary artery disease reported in terms of percentage of stenosis from zero to four and then 4A and 4B. Those are the severe 70 to 99% and 4B, the left main above 50 plus three vessel disease. What do you find here on, on, on the figure on the right side? That across all of the stenosis of the, of, of the coronaries identified, the, bl the blue bar, which is the FFR driven from CCTA, tends to have more positive ischemia reported compared to SPECT. So FFR derived CCTA is giving you more ischemia compared to SPECT. Well, did that matter for the outcome on follow-up? Well, the CCTA reported FFR being positive did not, but however, the SPECT imaging being positive did. So. What did they conclude? That in the real world cohort of high risk patients, the prevalence of ischemia throughout the range of CAD stenosis was higher with uh, FFR derived from uh, CTA versus SPECT, of course. That SPECT uh, actually showed you better than FFR derived by, from CTA, a prognostic call in terms of outcome of death, MI, or MACE. That's something enlightening, too, just to remember, if you, if you are interested in getting the FFR uh, derived C CCTA, you probably have to keep that in mind. So it overestimates the ischemia, and it overestimates the stenosis. We know that the CCTA does that. This is a study which came out uh, just this past month in the TCT. Um, uh, it's an elegant study which looked at STEMI patients coming in, Oh, I'm sorry, that's going fast. I don't know why. Let me put it on escape and bear with me so that it doesn't go fast. Um, so they looked, they looked at patients with STEMI, all comers, and they wanted to exclude the patients who might have an underlying, not so severe stenosis. This is playing by itself, huh? I am escaping it, my friend. Let me, just, let me just do that so that it doesn't do it, okay? I'm sorry for this. So they wanted to exclude the patients who had less than 70% stenosis, who might actually have a plaque erosion or OSCAD or spasm as the underlying etiology for the STEMI. So again, they, they, they established Timothy flow 
uh, with or without uh, aspiration, and they randomize them as a one-to-one -one OCT guidance versus just angio guidance, and the non-stenting strategy patients in terms of plaque erosion, scad, spasm, or rupture without dissection. Okay, I'll put the full screen, but it was jumping. Don't worry, don't worry. I'm fine. I'm fine, I'm fine. Yeah. So, what were, uh, I'm sorry for that, for this glitch, I don't know why, but uh, this is like a dancing. It's okay, don't worry. Is it showing there? Okay, let me just do it this way so that I don't waste the time for nothing. So what did the study show us? If you use OCT to guide your PCI stenting strategy, you probably will end up putting 15% more stenting compared to NGO alone. So OCT definitely will decrease the number of stenting of those patients, which makes sense. And out of the OCT group of 112, actually 50% of them did not have stenting in, the, in that particular study. And we, when you look at the patients who had the rupture, the rupture of the plaques, almost, almost half of them, those ruptured the plaque, did not have any stenting. Look at the erosion people. 86% did not need a stent. Calcified nodule, 80% did not. So it really makes a difference. This is just an illustr illustrative case, 40-year-old patient where the 40% angiostenosis in the proximal LED, the OCT showed uh, the erosion there, which you can appreciate in, uh, where the arrows are, and the minimal flow area was 3.64, patients did medically no stent, and the patient was doing well at one year. Follow up. Another case of rupture, the rupture plaque with the clot sitting there, again, 63-year-old STEMI patient, and the culprit was the uh, right coronary artery, and what happens is, again, the minimal flow area was 3.94, and the patient was treated medically, and at one year follow-up was stable. So what is this enlightening us? Guiding images with STEMI in patients who end up on angiography having less than 70% of stenosis, the OCT will definitely reduce the amount of stents which we put for our patients. This is an intriguing study, in my opinion. This is a non-invasive looking at echo, but I think that's an important study, too. Uh, look at this. This is, this is a physician-reported LVEF out of 400,000-plus echocardiography uh, on 200,000-plus unique patients. What did they find? They looked at the adjusted hazard for all-cause mortality. It looks like a J-shape, right? What happens is at 60 to 65 ejection fraction where the, where the neutrality line is, after that, when you have a higher ejection fraction, the mortality seems to be going up. And that was irrespective of age, gender uh, uh, of the patients. And what is, what is more important, that was irrespective of presence of heart failure either. So are we actually recognizing a new phenotype uh, characterized by supernormal LVEF? That's a big question, which I'm sure will be answered in the coming years. So having higher ejection fraction is not always good for you. This is another study which I think is a neat study. It's called the FFR REACT trial. What did they want to answer? FFR has been postulated uh, to, 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 to be uh, a, a, a good way of looking at successful PCI with stenting. If you reach above 90, you're happy. If you reach below 90, there is an increased rate of major adverse outcomes. So they looked at those patients who came in who had an FFR at the end of the stenting who, of, of below uh, 0.9. What did they find? As, as you might expect, that those patients who had an FFR below 0.9, 62% of them had an under-expansion of the stent, and 32% had malopposition. What is more intriguing here, one-third of the patients with the with the IVAS guidance to optimize, actually did not receive any extra treatment. 33% had just balloon angioplasty further for the stented area, and about 31% had to have more stenting put in. And the patients who had more stenting put in, look at this, it was mostly distal stenting. That's, I think, the Achilles heel when we do stenting. It's always the distal landing zone which needed the stenting. So what happened to the FFR post-optimization? Well, it increased significantly, but it did not reach 0.9 and above. And the FFR, 20% of the patients who had it below 
Can you give me two minutes because of the glitch which happened? I, I, can, can I? Yes, yes. Please. Can I? So, um, so guide, guiding optimization of patients with an FFR at the end of the procedure below 0.9 gave you more procedural time, more contrast time, and more fluoroscopy time. That's, that's something which we don't like interventions in the cat lab. The primary endpoint in terms of target vessel failure was not affected by optimization either. And what is more important, the secondary endpoints we did not came out to be positive. So what, the, what was the conclusion of the study? In patients with post-PCI FFR below 0.9, IVA's guidance in terms of optimization did not significantly improve the risk of one-year target vessel failure compared to standard of care. IVA's guided PCI optimization significantly improved post-PCI FFR, especially in the patients who had stenting for optimization. So the ones who had more stenting, for whatever reason, they got, they got it better. This is the last study which I think is an important study. We all know that the Achilles heel of distal lift main bifurcation, when you do provisional, you always worry about the circ. The circ, how can we know when we do, an, uh, do a provisional standing that this osteal circ to begin with, I should have done a two stent strategy with? This is a Chinese uh, study which with, with the background in mind that even in the Excel study, 22%, and the DK crash, 47% of those patients who underwent the planned provisional ended having two stents at the end of the procedure. And we know if you put another stent in the circ, in the distal lift main, there are reports that this leads to higher target lesion, lesion revascularization in the future. Sorry. What was the criteria for them bailing out? If the circ has more than 70% residual stenosis, if there's an osteal dissection more than type B, and the TIMI flow is less than three, what did they find? In the, in the IVUS, if you do the IVUS before you, you have 10 do, seconds, uh, okay, have. Uh, do the provisional, what they called layered plaques and having a calcified nodule and a minimal luminal area of below 4.9, actually are predictive of you failing to have one provisional stand. So if you do an IVS ahead of time and you get those combinations, you probably would know that you have, you have to have two stents to begin with. I'm sorry for, for the glitch. Thank you very much. <laughs>